Herzlich willkommen. Ja, heute geht es um nichts Geringeres als um die Zukunft der Menschheit. Unser Planet nämlich ist krank. Die Temperatur steigt und die Umweltzerstörung nimmt ihren Lauf. Mein heutiger Gast fordert darum eine radikale Kehrtwende, und zwar sofort. Gray Maxton ist Ökonom und war bis vor kurzem Generalsekretär des Club of Rome, der sich seit 50 Jahren um die Zukunft der Menschheit sorgt. Herzlich willkommen, Herr Maxton. Vielen Dank. Ja, wenn wir so weitermachen, dann wird die Erde äh, bald zwei Grad wärmer sein als vor der Industrialisierung. Und dann, sagen Sie, haben wir ein echtes Problem. Inwiefern hängt denn das Überleben der Menschheit von zwei Grad Celsius ab? Ja, yeah, I mean, I, I, I will speak to you in English. Um, mm -hmm. the, 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 we are, we are probably about 15 years away from reaching that two degree uh, point where where the level of, of gases in the atmosphere will make an increase of two degrees inevitable. It won't happen in 15 years because the system has delays in it. So it, it takes a long time for the atmospheric system to react. But we have about 15 years. And, and if, we, if we are stupid enough to reach that, grins, that, that border, then uh, we kick off a chain reaction, which would mean that the, the Arctic ice would melt faster and turn to water, which reflects more... Uh, absorbs more heat from the sun, it reflects, uh, the ice reflects uh, the heat and, and water absorbs it so that it speeds up the process. It would mean that the, the permafrost in Siberia and Canada would melt and release all the CO2 and methane that's under that. It would mean that much of the rainforest would die uh, and as the trees decay then they would release CO2. So it would kick off a chain reaction which would mean that we would reach three degrees, four degrees, five degrees. All that would take centuries but it would mean that the planet would go back to a time where, where most life is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. Deswegen hat man 2015 in Paris sich auch ein, auf ein ambitioniertes Ziel geeinigt, nämlich auf diese 1,5 Grad. Und gerade letzte Woche ist ein Sonderbericht erschienen des Weltklimarats, der zeigt, welche Folgen das hätte. Und wir schauen uns dazu kurz einen Beitrag aus der Tagesschau an. Die Konsequenzen der Erderwärmung. Sie sind bereits sichtbar. Extreme Wettersituationen mit langen Hitzeperioden und extremer Trockenheit sind nur ein Beispiel dafür. In ihrem Sonderbericht zeigen die Klimaforscher auf, welche Szenarien bei einer Erwärmung um 1,5 bzw. 2 Grad eintreten könnten. Fazit, ein halbes Grad Unterschied mache sehr wohl etwas aus. Das heißt zum Beispiel konkret, dass wir weniger stark Niederschlagsereignisse haben, dass wir weniger Überschwemmungen haben. Das heißt auch, dass in gewissen Bereichen die Dürrenperioden weniger häufig und auch weniger intensiv ausfallen. Um nur ein Beispiel zu nennen, es bedeutet aber auch, dass beispielsweise gewisse Ökosysteme wie Korallenriffe eben vielleicht teilweise gerettet werden könnten, die sonst dem Untergang geweiht sind, wenn die globale Erwärmung bis 2 Grad ansteigt. Um das 1,5 Grad Ziel noch zu erreichen, brauche es aber die notwendigen Anstrengungen. Man müsse eine schnelle Trendwende einleiten. Das heißt, wir müssen gezielt auf eine Null-Emissionssituation zusteuern, also netto Null. Und der Bericht sagt klar, eine Obergrenze von anderthalb Grad ist immer noch einhaltbar, wenn wir bis Mitte Jahrhundert rund 2050 auf netto Null kommen. Der neueste Sonderbericht des IPCC ist auch Grundlage für die nächste Weltklimakonferenz. Diese findet im Dezember im polnischen Katowice statt. Ja, ich hört man bis zur Mitte des, des Jahrhunderts. Äh, Sie sprechen von 15 oder 20 Jahren. Ähm, was ist jetzt richtig? Uh, both are right. I, I, what I'm saying is exactly the same thing. That if we start today uh, and we begin to reduce our emissions in, in, a, in, a, in a regular quantity every year, then we can make it last for 30 years. We can reduce by 3% a year every year and by 2050 we can be at zero. So I've said this, this as well. But I think what, what is not clear is what that actually means. Today, the, the level of emissions is, t is tied to the amount of energy we use, which is tied directly to the size of the economy. Now, the two go absolutely in parallel. If we want to reduce emissions by 3% next year, which is what we need to do, and then 3% the next year, and 3% the next mm. year, so in three years, almost 10%, that means that the economy has to be 10% smaller unless we can decouple the economy, which, is, which we've not been able to do so far. So, so it, it actually means that we have to make a very radical change in how we live 
if we're to meet that that mm. that 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 goal. It's not saying that we can wait till 2049 and then change everything. Mm. We have to start doing it now. And the, the, the longer we wait, the worse it will be. Genau. Also es geht darum, das Schlimmste zu verhindern. Deswegen fordern Sie in Ihrem neuen Buch auch einen radikalen Wechsel. Sie sagen, die Party ist vorbei. Ähm, wir brauchen eine, eine radikale Umformung unseres Wirtschaftssystems, unserer Werte. Und da sprechen Sie auch für den, für den Club of Rome, der das seit 50 Jahren eigentlich sagt und ähm, das Wachstum kritisiert. Ähm, 1972 kam ein Bericht ähm, des Club of Rome, die Grenzen des Wachstums. Ja. Hauptaussage war, ein grenzenloses Wachstum ist unter be begrenzten Ressourcen nicht möglich. Und die Prognose war dass unser Wirtschaftssystem in der Mitte des 21. Jahrhunderts zusammenbrechen wird. Hatten die recht damals? I don't want to say that they did, but they did because it's a tragic a tragic story. I, I limits to growth was basically correct. I mean, I should make it clear that the limits to growth was not a forecast, it was not a prediction. It was a series of scenarios which examined what would happen if we did not change. And it said that if we did not change in terms of the volume of resources we were using or the growth of the population or the growth of the economy, then by around 2030, 2040, the system would collapse. But you'd be able to see that collapse long before and the, the consequences would be visible long after, just like any major change in history. If you think about the, the French Revolution or the, the First World War, you could see that building up for years before mm. and you could see the consequences for years after. And we can see this collapse happening now. Climate change is the most obvious signal that, that the system is falling apart. But with the loss of so many species, with migration problems, with the pollution of the oceans and the atmosphere, these are all signs that we're pushing too hard on, on the gas pedal. And, and the problem or the difference between now and 1972 is that in 1972 we could avoid this problem. Today we're in the middle of it. And so all we can do is, is try and restrict the consequences. We can't stop it now. Mm. Wir werden gleich über Ihre Vorschläge sprechen. Ähm, zunächst interessiert mich mal, ähm, was kann ich denn als Privatperson tun mm. dagegen? Also es gibt ja jetzt in 50 Jahren 1968, damals war der Slogan, ähm, das Private ist politisch. Eigentlich könnten die Bürgerinnen und Bürger und Konsumenten doch einen radikalen Wandel herbeiführen, indem sie ihr Konsumverhalten einfach ändern. When I when I give talks, this is a question that always comes up. What can I do? And I, I understand this question because I'm trying to do everything I can to, to, to change the system. The unfortunate answer is is not much. If you become vegan, if you recycle your bottles, if you switch to an electric car, if you take the train instead of flying. Machen Sie das alles? Ich probiere. I try, try to. I try to do these things. <laughs> But I still take lots of flights, so I you know, destroy my carbon footprint very quickly. But even if everybody in Europe did that, everybody in Europe lived as, as sustainably as possible, it would not change the future. Because if you think about it, you've got three, four hundred million people in Europe, but you've got nearly you know, another seven and a half billion who are not doing that. Hmm. And, and although the, the ecological footprint is much higher in the rich world, it's growing much faster in places like India and China and Africa. So even if everybody in the rich world, the billion people in the rich world, lived as, as sustainably as possible, our, our future stays the same. Mm -hmm. Bei Ihnen gab es ja im Persönlichen auch eine ne Wende. Sie haben davor, habe ich gelesen, im Bankensektor ja. gearbeitet, auch für die liberale britische Wochenzeitung The Economist. Und dann irgendwann kam diese Wende und Sie kamen zum Club of Rome. Was, was hat das ausgelöst? It's a very good question and a very, for me, a very interesting change in my life. I, I was working in Hong Kong. Uh, I was spending a lot of time writing about China, spending a lot of time in Southeast Asia. This was in, in the mid 2000s, so just before the financial crisis. And I began, when I traveled around places like Thailand and Indonesia and Malaysia, I could see that, that economic growth was not delivering high standards of living. It was moving people into a different sort of poverty in the cities. They were, they were becoming into the money economy, but they were living often very hard working, very hard lives in the city. The pollution was going up. I could see there was something wrong with what we were saying. And then came the financial crisis, which the economist and certainly I predicted. We, we anticipated this financial crisis. And 
And you could see the consequences for a lot of people were dreadful. And so I thought to myself, for the last 20 years, we've been promoting a system and a philosophy which is based on economic growth, which is not actually helping most people. It's not lifting people out of poverty. It's not reducing inequality. And, and I went to the editors of The Economist and I said, look, I think we have, to, we have to reflect on this. We have to think about what we've been saying. And they were not as keen as I was to do that. So uh, they are now. They're beginning to go through a process now, which is very interesting. Um, but but I, I went away and I wrote a book and I did some research um, and I, I, I came to the conclusion that what we'd been saying was wrong, that we needed to change, that, that, that there were limits to growth. Mm -hmm. Es ist schon wirklich, wir werden gleich noch über diese radikalen äh, Veränderungen sprechen, die es nach Ihrer Ansicht braucht. Jetzt, ich frage mich einfach, die Schweiz hat, äh, die, die Bevölkerung hat in den letzten Jahren über die neue Energiestrategie 2050 abgestimmt. Klarerweise muss die Schweiz die, den ökologischen Fußabdruck ähm, verkleinern. Wir leben so, als, äh, bräuchten, oder, äh, als, gäbe es vier, als hätten wir vier Erden zur Verfügung. Ähm, aber wir haben uns darauf geeinigt, Ausstieg aus der Atomenergie, mehr Erneuerbare, ähm, mehr Energieeffizienz und weniger Emissionen. Ist das für Sie alles nur Kosmetik, was da die Politik derzeit entscheidet? In Switzerland. I, I, Switzerland has a, a wonderful reputation for being clean, with clean air, a wonderful standard of living. And, and to some extent, everybody lives in a bit of a bubble here. Uh, but that's true for much of Europe. But what you say is also true. It has a very high ecological footprint. It's four, it was, most Swiss people live as if we had four planets, mm. uh, which is among the highest in the world. Uh, and people are not willing to make a decision to, to, to make the shift very easily, which is why I, this, can't, this, this change cannot happen through the market. It can't happen through, through us all gradually deciding to shift to another system because that's profitable and it makes economic sense. We have to, we have to regulate. We have to, to, to encourage people to change their way of life through regulation, unfortunately, but that, that's what we need to do. We don't need to go back to the dark ages. We don't need to go back to, to, to live as if we were even in the 17th or 18th century. We need to go back to a living standard that's perhaps more like the 1970s or the 1960s, where not so many people have cars. We don't have cheap Uh, flights, we don't have holidays in, in, in the Seychelles, we, 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 we don't consume and throw away nearly so much as we do today. We can have a very good standard of living. We don't need to, 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 to you know, live as if we're in caves. But we do need to change what we're doing and we need to change it radically. Also Sie sagen, die Menschheit wird das freiwillig nicht machen. Man muss sie zum Überleben eigentlich äh, zwingen, wenn ich Sie richtig äh, verstehe. Jetzt ist es so, Sie Sie entweihen ja eigentlich den heiligen Gral der Ökonomen, nämlich das, das Wachstum und sagen, das ist sozusagen die Wurzel des Übels, auch des Klimawandels, das Wirtschaftswachstum. Genau. Warum denn? Können Sie das noch mal erläutern? I mean, it's very simple. I, to have more growth every year means that we need to produce more, obviously. We need to sell more and that means we need to produce more. So to produce more, we need to dig up more resources. We need to dig up whatever it is, the, 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 the metals or the change the oil into plastic, whatever we need to manufacture, we need to produce more every year. Aber darf ich noch kurz zurückfragen? Mm. Wenn ich jetzt äh, eine neue App für mein iPhone irgendwie produziere, dann ist das doch ein, da brauche ich keine Ressourcen für, außer für das iPhone, aber für die Software nicht und das ist ein neues Produkt. Das Obviously gibt's. services require fewer resources, but they still require something. You still have to have a computer and you still have to have an internet connection and all of that requires something to be produced. So it's not, I mean, if you're cutting hair, then you're not using many resources. But, <laughs> but there's not many, many businesses. And most of our economy today is still based on the throughput of resources. And to produce these goods, we require energy. It's, it's, it's very simple. We have to produce electricity or, or some form of energy. And 80% of that energy comes from fossil fuels. 80%. Uh, 80%. And, and although we've invested a lot in, in renewables, by far the majority of it will still come from fossil energy, according to the fossil fuel industry, in 20 years. So, so because 80% comes from that, that creates the CO2, that creates the methane, that creates the nitrous oxide, and that then creates global warming. Right. So the push for always more growth is the direct cause Of climate change. Also Sie sagen ja, die, das Wachstum ist noch sozusagen die Ursache von weiteren Übeln, nämlich Arbeitslosigkeit, was mich sehr überrascht hat, 
und soziale Ungleichheit. That's absolutely correct. I, I, we, we have this, I mean, we'll talk, I think, later about why we're not changing. But part of it is because we have this, this view of the world in our heads mm. about, about how it functions, about how we develop, about what progress means, about what happiness means. And most of it is wrong. It's very difficult to get, you know, it's such a big... But, but the idea that economic growth is necessary is fundamentally wrong. Uh, we lived for centuries without any economic growth, and we didn't, you know, we didn't necessarily have a very high standard of living, but that's a different question. Mm. We, could have, we, we need to separate living standards and growth. But, but if, you, if you think about it, we've had 200 years of industrial development, and the gap between the rich world and the poor world is bigger today than it was in 1820. And the gap between the rich and the poor in Europe is bigger today than it was in 1914, so, so before the First World War. So all this economic growth has not reduced inequality. It has not reduced the gap between rich and poor. It's increased it because, as Thomas Piketty said in his famous book a few years ago, Capital in the 21st Century, the entire system rewards the rich. Yes. The money flows upwards. It doesn't come down into the pockets of the poor. It flows upwards into, yeah. the, into the pockets of the rich. And we believe the opposite because we're told the opposite. Mm -hmm. And the same is true with unemployment. If you look at the rich world since 1990, we've had some of the fastest growth in human history. And yet the unemployment has gone up. Wir haben mit jemandem gesprochen im Vorfeld dieser Sendung, der das ganz anders sieht, und zwar mit Samuel Rutz vom äh, Schweizer Think Tank Avaniers Wissen. Wir hören uns das kurz an. Heute gibt es in der Ökonomie eigentlich einen weitgehenden Konsens, dass Wirtschaftswachstum ab einem gewissen Grad die Arbeitslosigkeit reduziert und nicht umgekehrt. Es gibt sogar einen Namen für, für diesen Zusammenhang, das ist das sogenannte Okunsche Gesetz. Es ist wahrscheinlich weniger ein Gesetz als einfach ein stabiler ähm, empirischer Zusammenhang, den man seit Jahren beobachten kann. Gerade auch heute sieht man das ja wieder in, in Europa. In den letzten Jahren hat das Wachstum etwas zugenommen und jetzt reagiert auch die Arbeitslosigkeit, sie geht zurück. Jetzt behauptet Gray Maxter noch, dass äh, das Wirtschaftswachstum die Ungleichheit verschärft oder erhöht. Wie sehen Sie das? Ja, diese Frage wird bei den Ökonomen schon, hunderten von, schon seit Hunderten von Jahren eigentlich darüber diskutiert, wie der Zusammenhang zwischen Wachstum und Gleichheit oder eben Verteilung ist. Ähm, so Mitte der, ich würde sagen, des 20. Jahrhunderts kon konnte man das eben auch empirisch überprüfen. Auch da gibt es dann einen Ökonomen, der sich einen Namen gemacht hat. Das ist der Herr Kuznetz. Ähm, der, nach dem wurde die Kuznetz-Kurve benannt. Das ist ähm, so ein Zusammenhang, der zeigt, wenn, das, wenn die Wirtschaft wächst am Anfang, dann nimmt die Ungleichheit zu. Aber dann kommt so ein Tipping Point und dann nimmt die Ungleichheit wieder ab. Bei den Ländern ist der Zusammenhang nicht so eindeutig. Aber auf der globalen Ebene, auch da besteht sicher ein Konsens, Wirtschaftswachstum hat der Welt geholfen. Die Armut ist zurückgegangen, in den letzten 50 Jahren mehr als in den 500 Jahren je zuvor. Ähm, und es ist nicht nur materiell, dass es den Leuten besser geht, sondern das zeigt sich auch in anderen Indikatoren wie der Kindersterblichkeit, wie ähm, die Leute werden älter, also die Lebenserwartung steigt, die Hungertoten nehmen ab und so weiter. Also da ist wirklich, glaube ich, ein Konsens da, das Wirtschaftswachstum hat der Welt insgesamt global gesehen geholfen. Ja, die Welt wird besser global gesehen dank des Wachstums. The world has got better, yes. We've had economic growth, yes. The two are not necessarily connected. It depends on what period you look at. Uh, when he talks about, about uh, un um, unemployment going down or about inequality going down, th the figures I gave before, about 200 years of, of, of growth increasing the, the gap and 100 years increasing the gap in the rich world, they're from the OECD. They, they come from the, the Club for Rich Countries. So, so these are this is a, official figures. It's certainly true that after the Second World War, up until the late 1970s, There was a period of strong economic growth and there was a period of prosperity. Mm. Living standards improved, in inequality fell, jobs were created. Now, was that just because of growth? And, and I would argue that growth was there, but that was almost a byproduct. We started from a low base after the war, so we had to rebuild. That created lots of growth, but it also improved living standards. But the key difference was that in that period, there was also a great deal of government influence. 
there was the beginnings of the welfare state, the creation of healthcare systems, the welfare systems, of helping people uh, when they were unemployed, providing pensions. All of that happened in that period because the state played a much bigger role. Now, at the end of the 1970s, the the neoliberals began to take more more say, and then at the end of the 1980s, the, the, the only competing system, the communist system in the Soviet Union, began to collapse. Mm. And so since then, we've seen a much stronger form of neoliberal economics, mm. and that's pushing things back in the other direction, and so the inequality is rising again. Jetzt ist für mich die Frage, ob man das Kind gleich mit dem Bade ausschütten muss oder ob es Formen des Wachstums gibt, die nachhaltig sind, grünes Wachstum. Und auch darüber habe ich noch mal mit, mit Samuel Rutz gesprochen. Wir hören uns das kurz an. Wenn wir von Wachstum sprechen, dann meinen wir am Schluss immer Innovationen, technischer Fortschritt. Also es geht ja nicht darum, dass da irgendwelche Zahlen einfach aus dem Hut gezaubert werden, sondern dahinter stehen Innovationen, technischer Fortschritt. Das ist ganz wichtig. Jetzt, wenn man den Klimawandel anschaut, finde ich das eigentlich faszinierend, dass zum Beispiel, wenn wir die Schweiz nehmen, dieser Prozess längst auch eingesetzt hat. Also seit den 80er Jahren sind die Emissionen in der Schweiz konstant. Das reicht natürlich jetzt nicht, um irgendwelche Klimaziele zu erreichen, wie man es in Paris gesetzt hat. Aber immerhin, man sieht, dass sich das Emissions oder die Emissionen vom Wirtschaftswachstum entkoppelt haben zu einem gewissen Teil. Und das wäre ohne Wirtschaftswachstum nie möglich gewesen. Und nochmals, es geht um die Innovationen, die dahinter stehen. Nicht um, um das Wachstum an sich, sondern das, was Wachstum eben am Schluss verkörpert. Innovationen, technischer Fortschritt. Und in dem Sinn, glaube ich, kann man wirklich sagen, dass eben das Wirtschaftswachstum nicht in dem Sinn der, der Sünder ist, sondern es ist Teil dieser Lösung, dass man irgendwo einbeziehen muss, wenn man das Klima retten will, sozusagen. Ja, was ist denn mit Wachstum, das durch grüne, nachhaltige Technologien und Innovationen erzeugt wird? Okay, I mean, there's several, several interesting questions here. One, do we need growth at all? Uh, secondly, is there technological solutions or is green growth a solution? If you take the GDP of the rich world and divide it by the population, there is easily enough wealth and income and work for everyone. It doesn't need to grow. We could, if, it's simply the problem is that it's badly divided, that, that it's unevenly distributed. So there are poor people and there are rich people. But if you could take the system and simply divide it by the population, everybody could live perfectly well. So you don't need this growth. So that's, first of all, a fantasy. But the other fantasy is that we can solve this problem within the existing system. This, this whole push for green growth, for, uh, for, for, for sustainable business, is complete nonsense. I, I mean, it, it, it's a popular message because it suits, it suits the, the, the narrative, that people think they don't have to change so much, that we can find a way of just tweaking the system a little bit and everything will be okay. Mm. But the entire system depends on growth, depends on growth and resources, and it depends on making a profit in every stage of the, of, of, of the, of the process, which increases the inequality. But the whole thing is driven by this, this need to grow more. And even if you call it green, you're still doing the same thing. You still have to have all that energy which creates the, the, the emissions. We need to get off this idea that, 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 that there's any fix within the system. There's no market-based solution to this because there's no profit in fixing climate change. Aber es kommt darauf an, wie diese Energie erzeugt wird. Also bei yes. mit nachhaltigen Lösungen und so weiter, erneuerbaren Energien, dann yeah. ist, wäre Wachstum kein Problem mehr. Well, it's not just, I mean, it, first of all, let's deal with the energy problem. Yes, it depends how we generate the energy. Uh, but, but first of all, it's going to take us a long time to convert everything to, to solar or wind or, 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 or nuclear or whatever is, is, is not going to create these emissions. Uh, that will cost a great deal of money. In the meantime, you've got the oil industry still investing every year. Uh, last year, we had 70 gigawatts of new fossil energy and, and 40 gigawatts of that was coal. So we're still increasing the amount of investment in old energy, and that's making us the, the problem worse. Uh, but secondly, even if we have a completely renewable energy system, how do you make the solar panels? How do you make the windmills? Do you, you know, when you make the cars, you have to have the batteries in them, and they're from pretty nasty metals, which are in you know, limited supplies. You still have the factories, which need require the energy. There's still there's still a hundred ways that we're using resources and energy, which we can't do in the long term. We have to find a way to wean ourselves off. Genau. Deswegen sagen Sie jetzt auch, es braucht einen Systemwechsel und es braucht Verbote 
Bestrafungen oder zumindest Besteuerungen auf alles, was der Umwelt und dem Klima schadet. Wollen Sie konkret das Fliegen oder das Autofahren verbieten? Slowly, yes. I, I mean, I know that's a shocking thing to say when, when people want to go away for the weekend to Barcelona or Rome for 100 francs and they can do that today. But it doesn't make any sense for the environment. I, I, this, when you say, you know, we have, I, I want to change the system, yes and no. I, I want to see a different economic system. But now is not the time to think about what a better economic system looks like. Now is not the time to think about a sustainable economic system. That will take maybe decades or generations to come up. We need something like a new enlightenment to rethink our, our entire social system. In the meantime, what we must do is stop polluting the atmosphere, stop damaging the planet. And, and that means we have to stop doing the things that are, are creating the damage. We have to stop burning coal. We have to stop using oil, we have to stop using gas as fast as possible. Now, we have 20 years, maybe, but the faster we do it, the easier it'll be. And we still then have a very high chance of getting in ourselves into trouble. But it's not just that. We have to stop driving cars. We have to stop taking flights. We have to stop using ships. We have, I mean, all those things are creating the problem. Now, everybody will look at this and go, this is madness. <laughs> and it is, the longer we wait, because the, then the more radical it has to be. But, but it's a bit like, you know, a, a doctor says to you, you know, you've got lung cancer and, and, and you should stop smoking. And you say, well, I can't do that. It's too inconvenient. You have to stop. Yeah. And it's the same with yeah. this. We have to stop and we have to find a way to make that possible. And so the people who, who depend on the auto industry or, the, or who work in the aviation industry, we have to find a way to help these people so that they don't personally suffer, mm. but that they stop what they're doing. Mm. Mm. Also, Sie machen ja in Ihren Büchern ganz konkrete Vorschläge. Zum Beispiel <lacht> sagen Sie, jeder darf nur noch jährlich 1000 Kilometer fliegen, zum Beispiel. Ähm, mit dem Autofahren sind es 3000 Kilometer. Dann fordern Sie einen internationalen Strafgerichtshof, äh, an dem man dann Manager oder Eigentümer von Firmen anklagt, die umweltschädigend äh, sind. Ähm, das klingt für mich nach einer Öko-Diktatur, <lacht> würde ich mal sagen. Und die Frage ist, also ich meine, das kann man ja behaupten, aber die Frage ist, wie wir das umsetzen. Ja, yeah, I'm not saying this is easy. I, I know this is a very difficult. Uh, we are up against a wall here. We are up against a situation where it's almost like it's almost like we have to adopt like a war mentality. Uh, it's it's like we have to make a big change in our economy in a very short time. Because it's an emergency. So we're in Notstand. Exactly, also exactly. It's like it's like it's like, it's mm. like a Notstand. Uh, we have to make a lot of changes, even though that is difficult. Uh, if you if you think about even what we heard about that IPCC report, thirty five percent reduction in emissions by twenty thirty, eighty percent by twenty forty. Uh, that means we have to stop doing what we're doing, and. And I understand that's difficult. If we do it now, then we can do it you know, 3% a year. 3% sounds manageable. But it's still 35% fewer cars, 35% fewer flights, 35% fewer ships in 10 years. That's a huge that's change. Yeah. Mm. But, but the choice is continuing as we are, or, or you put into question the entire future existence of humanity. I mean, it's that big a question. It won't affect you or, or your children. You know, I mean, your children, your grandchildren will have a pretty unpleasant life. But, but, but it means that within decades, mm. I mean, if you look at just in the middle, around the um, Mediterranean, I mean, you're looking at 20 or 30 years before it's going to be impossible to live there. I, I mean, there will be no water. You won't be able to grow crops. You, you know, people will have to move away from Greece, from parts of southern Italy, from southern Portugal. From, this is not uh, just in Bangladesh. This is going to be affecting us in Europe. Mm. Ja, wenn man Ihre Bücher liest, dann wird einem das so ein bisschen klar und dann versteht man vielleicht auch, warum Sie so radikale Vorschläge machen. Also der eine ist ja in, in diesem Buch, in Ihrem letzten Buch, ein mm. Prozent ist genug, zusammen mit Jürgen äh, Randers, stellvertretender Generaldirektor des WWF. Ähm, schlagen Sie so etwas wie eine Ein-Kind-Politik vor für Industrieländer? Also Sie sagen 80.000 Dollar Verzichtsprämie für Frauen mit 50, die kein Kind oder bloß ein Kind haben. 
Ja, Braucht es wirklich solch radikale Eingriffe in unsere Freiheit? I, 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 I regret that we wrote that because because uh, we it's created such a big backlash, uh, particularly in the German-speaking world. What we were trying to say, and what I think is still important, is that that you know I said I said before that the main cause of climate change is the economic system. The other main cause is population. When I was born in 1960, there were three billion people in the world. Today, we're approaching eight billion. We add 80 million a year. We add another Germany every year. And most of the people, I mean, three, three billion people today are very young. I mean, their future ecological footprint is still increasing. Mm. And, and we're not discussing this issue. This issue is constantly pushed under the carpet. And we think also that it's a problem for the poor world. You know, it's the Chinese, the Indians, it's the Africans. They're the people that need to stop having children. And what Jürgen and I were trying to say is, let's discuss this issue and let's be aware that we in the rich world are part of the problem too because our children have a much, much bigger ecological impact than a child born in Africa. Aber wenn Sie finden, das muss diskutiert werden, warum bereuen Sie denn, dass Sie das geschrieben haben? <lacht> Because everybody latches onto this $80,000 premium. Uh, everybody latches onto this money. And that then distracts. The population issue is such a difficult issue because people get so emotional about it. Warum is that so? Because it's, it's perhaps the most personal of freedoms. They, they, they believe that they have a particular right uh, to have children. And I understand that. And, and I think, you know, when, when Ein Prozent Miskunuk was published, It was also at the time when the big wave of migration was coming into Germany. And people in Germany were saying to themselves, what does it mean to be German? What happens when our population shrinks and the, migration, the, the migrants increase? What does it mean to be... And it hit at a very raw nerve. And I think that also made it very emotional. I, I, I regret that we put that number on it, but, mm. but I still think that this is an issue which is a, a, a major cause mm. of, of our problems and, and we, we don't discuss it. And you know, nature will solve the problem for us unless we, we come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. In Ihrem Buch schlagen Sie auch ein, ein Amt für einen geordneten Übergang vor, schreiben Sie, also wo wir jetzt sozusagen diesen Systemwechsel äh, vornehmen können. Und darin gibt es auch ein Amt für die Medien und für deren Aufsicht. Wollen Sie auch die Pressefreiheit abschaffen? I, you know, I said before, uh, that, 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 that we, need to, we need to think about this in a different way, as if we were approaching a war situation. And it, it's a, uh, it, that requires a different approach. One of the problems we've had consistently in the last 10 years is, <laughs> I want to use Donald Trump's fake news, but we've had a lot of people reporting that climate change is not really a problem and that it's all made up by the, by the, the climate skeptics, exactly. It's all made up by the, yeah. the left-wing socialists who don't actually understand how the world should work. And, 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 and they have created a bigger problem because a lot of people are genuinely confused about what's happening and what needs to change. Yeah. So the media has, has, a, has, a, had, has played a, a negative role to some extent in that process. And we need the media to help in this point. It's a bit like we're going to run a, 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 help people understand the need for change. Mm. And, and in the communications area, in the advertising arena, and in the media, uh, producing you know, both sides of the argument, which confuses people, is not at this point very helpful. Aber ich meine, das eine ist zu sagen, was die Leitmedien berichten sollten, das andere ist, Stimmen zu verbieten, natürlich, und da wäre ich jetzt skeptisch. Ich möchte mit Ihnen noch darüber sprechen, wie teuer dieses, das Ganze eigentlich wird und wer das bezahlen soll, weil da haben Sie ja auch ganz konkrete Vorschläge. Um, to some extent, it does not matter. I, I, I mean, <lacht> it really doesn't matter what it costs, because, because money is just an invention. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's just numbers on computers. Money doesn't actually exist. <lacht> I mean, it's just something we've invented and we get very worked up about it. And, and when the banking system went into crisis in 2008, I mean, even since, even today, the central banks around the world are still printing money, and not in the US, but certainly in Europe and Japan and, and in England, they're still printing money to try and keep the economy going and keep the banking sector going. They printed, they printed trillions of dollars and trillions of francs. Yeah. To get, so they can print money when they want to save the banking sector. We can print money to save the planet. 
So the money thing does. But what would it cost? Okay, what, so what would it cost? So, so to, to convert the energy system over, over the next 20 years might cost, might cost maybe 10 to 15% of GDP. It's not a huge amount of money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you divide it over 15 or 20 years, 1% more each year, which is yeah. where our 1% came from before, we can begin to shift the economy in, in, the, in the right direction without spending a huge amount of money. But that doesn't account for all the resources that are left in the ground, the, the so-called stranded assets, all the oil that cannot be dug up, the coal that has to stay there, the gas. That, so, so all these companies would get themselves into deep financial trouble. Mm-hmm. It doesn't account for the compensation that has to be given for all the people that would lose their jobs. It doesn't account for all the, the people in the auto industry or the aviation industry that would have it. So all of that together, you know, you're looking at, at probably you know, 30 or 40% of world GDP, plus a reduction in world GDP. Mm-hmm. It's a huge cost, mm-hmm. but we can spread it over 20 years. If we wait 10 years, we'll have to do it much faster. Mm-hmm. Sie sagen ja auch, die Besteuerung spielt eine ganz äh, zentrale ähm, eine Rolle. Also man sollte ähm, eben die richtigen Dinge besteuern, sagen Sie. Nicht die Arbeit, sondern Rohstoffe, Emissionen, äh, Müll, Abfall. Ähm, man sollte die, die Reichen besteuern, 100% Erd- Erbschaftssteuer und so weiter. Reduktion der Arbeitszeit äh, fordern Sie auch. Alle diese, diese Vorschläge, die müssten ja global durchgesetzt werden, weil das Klimaproblem ist kein nationales Problem, sondern ein globales. Problem. Da stellt sich für mich die Frage, wer setzt das durch mm. ähm, oder wer geht als Vorbild voran. Und da hat mich überrascht zu lesen, dass Sie die Hoffnung setzen auf China, auf den Papst und <lacht> aufs Militär. <lacht> Not just, nicht nur. Okay, so, we don't have a global government. To, 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 to bring this into... I, 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 let me say again, I have not said at any point this is easy. I am saying that this is the only way that I can see. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, to be honest, my hope is very small that this will happen. I do not feel very optimistic about where we're going. But it's quite clear we don't have global government. We, the UN is not in the role to do that. I do a lot of work with the UN. They feel as powerless as, 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 as most of us. Mm-hmm. So where do you begin? You begin with the people who understand the problem best. Now, in my experience... The German-speaking world is well-educated, is environmentally aware, has a history of acting together for the good of all. And so that's a good place to begin. The, the, the Germans, Germany, Austria, parts, mm-hmm. of, parts of Switzerland maybe, <laughs> Scandinavia, these countries understand the problems and have potentially the ability to, to set an example to others. Mm-hmm. Now, the reason I say China is because Xi Jinping... Has, has specifically set a goal to become an ecological civilization. Oh, yeah. Now, the Chinese are the world's biggest polluter, but they are also investing more in renewable energy than all the rest of the world put together. Prozentual or absolute? Absolute. Oh, yeah. I, I, and they invested yeah. more last year than America has in 50 years. So, so the Chinese, they may be creating a lot of pollution, but they're very serious about changing. They see the problem better than most. And because because the, uh, they, they, they don't have to worry about d- democracy, they can, they can implement their changes much more easily. So, uh, you, and then you, you, know, you mentioned the Pope. Pope Francis has been particularly uh, outspoken against the, the problems of the economic system and the whole uh, Laudato Si paper that was produced a few years ago was in- incredibly accurate in what he was talking about, about climate change. Mm. The military, the, the German military, the American military, they understand incredibly well the danger, the, the security danger of climate change, the migration risks. And so you begin, uh, the, the justice system, the, the education system, you begin to see a group of people, a yeah. very strange coalition of, of, of organizations and countries that actually understand the problem and that want to do something about it. Mm-hmm. And if you add the Chinese and the Catholic Church and the, 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 the parts of Europe, you begin to get to two, three billion people who actually want to change. Mm-hmm. Now, my idea is that perhaps if they set an example, then maybe the others will follow. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's probably the best chance that we've got right now. Mm-hmm. Aber leider geht es im Moment halt nicht voran. Ich möchte mit Ihnen jetzt darüber sprechen, woran das liegen könnte. Und äh, Adrian Brücker, ein Verhaltensforscher aus der Uni Bern, ähm, schreibt, Menschen sind dann zum Handeln bereit, wenn sie sich von einem Problem betroffen fühlen und glauben, etwas dagegen tun zu können. 
Und beides ist beim Klimawandel eben nicht oder nur bedingt gegeben. Was tut man jetzt dagegen? He is absolutely right. And this is one of the biggest problems that for most people, uh, you know, I, I read in the summer in Switzerland, I mean, in 20 Minuten, or if you go to Austria in, in Heute, they talk about a lovely sunbathing weather. And so people don't realize that two degrees actually takes the planet back 10 million years. It seems like it's a small change. They don't understand that the weather we're seeing today is not because of the emissions that we produced a week ago, but the emissions we produced 15 years ago. Mm. And so what, what will happen in the next 15 years is that no matter what we do, it will get worse. And, and, and the risk is that when we are all absolutely clear, when we all experience like that fire in Greece or the storm in Hong Kong or the, uh, a few weeks ago, which was the worst storm ever, when we all experience that and we're all absolutely clear, it's too late. Also das heißt, es braucht den Leidensdruck, es braucht Katastrophen, Dürren, Überschwemmungen, Stürme, damit wir handeln. Ansonsten ist das Problem irgendwie, diese Verzögerung ist zu langsam, die ganzen Zeithorizonte sind zu weit für unseren menschlichen Verstand. Verstehe ich das richtig? Ja, I mean, one of the biggest reasons that we are not changing is because we don't understand uh, the, 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 what's called the feedback loops in the atmosphere. I mean, the, 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 the scientists do. But the fact that what we did 15 years ago is what's happening today. If you think about putting a, a pot on, on the stove and boiling a pot of water, you, know, you have the gas on full, but it still takes all that time to generate the energy to heat the water. Und es beschleunigt sich selbst, habe ich bei Ihnen gelesen. Exactly. Der ganze well, exactly, exactly. And that's the risk in this one. But, but, but there's a time lag between what happens, what yeah. we do, and, what, and the effect. And that's what people don't understand. Yeah. Now, it's extremely difficult. To, to get people to understand that. And it's extremely difficult, therefore, to make this change. And that's why, why my, my mm. proposal is that we bring together those that do understand that. I, you know, what, what makes me hopeful is that there are more people every day that see the risk. That report a few weeks ago from, from South Korea, from the IPCC, that created a huge amount of media coverage. And so more people understand the risk. We're moving in the right direction, but we're still moving too slowly, unfortunately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dann gibt es noch die, dieses Problem mit der Verantwortungsdiffusion, dass jeder von uns, uns verantwortlich ist, bis zu einem gewissen Grad, aber jeder hat das Gefühl, das ist ein Tropfen auf den heißen Stein und ich möchte nicht mit der Veränderung anfangen, andere sollen das, das tun. Wie löst man diese Probleme? Was sind für Sie so yeah, die I, wichtigsten? I, I mean, this whole idea that we can change the world as consumers is just nonsense. Uh, or that we are the source of the problem is also wrong. You didn't make decisions to build coal power stations, and neither did I. There, and this is why, you know, you mentioned earlier on about having some sort of international court of justice. Yeah. There are people who are responsible for this. There are people who have made decisions, politicians or people in the oil, coal and gas industry, who have invested in this, knowing, knowing that this problem would happen. The oil industry has known about climate change for more than 20 years. Yeah. And they have continued to invest in that. Now, to me, they need to be held accountable for what, for, for the problem. And they are the solution. I mean, it, it's them stopping what they're doing. What you and I do is going to change nothing. Okay. We need to stop the source. And that means we have to stop these industries. Okay. Für mich ist einfach die Frage, welche Strategie man wählt. Macht man auf Panikmache, wie der Club of Rome schon seit 50 Jahren macht, oder versucht man es mit moderaten Geschichten zu machen, mit Erfolgsgeschichten? Mich würde auch interessieren, ähm, wie das für Sie ist. Sie schreiben an einer Stelle, ähm, die große Herausforderung wird mentaler Natur sein. Das heißt im Kopf, wir dürfen den Optimismus und den Mut nicht verlieren. W was machen Sie persönlich gegen, gegen diese Verzweiflung <lacht> angesichts dieser, dieser Tatsache? Das ist eine gute Frage. Ich wache manchmal auf und denke, es ist zu spät, es ist zu spät, ich kann es nicht machen. Und manchmal wache ich auf und denke, okay, ich muss weitergehen. Es ist sehr schwierig für mich, aber auch für die for not just me, but, but many of the, of the Club of Rome members who have who've worked in this area for a long time, who feel emotionally attached to it, who, f who want to do the right thing for the planet and for humanity. And I mean, after Grenz uh, the Limits to Growth was published, I mean, the authors were mocked, they were laughed at, and yet they were right. Uh, it is extremely difficult to feel optimistic some days, but, But as 
you know, Margaret Thatcher might have said in, in a different way, there is no alternative. We have to find a way to solve this problem. We have to move forward. Mm. And I, I, don't, I don't buy into this idea that we have to have a, 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 a positive narrative, an optimistic way. This is a... Warum nicht? I, it's a very, um, I think, a very American way of thinking about things. That we, we have to have a happy Hollywood ending. Uh, we have to be realistic. Life, life in the next 20 years is going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be... Living standards are not going to be higher. Wages are not going to be higher. We're going to have to make some very difficult decisions and the climate is going to get scarier. And, and, and to pretend that it's all going to be uh, a, fluffy pink, a, a fluffy pink future <laughs> is not helpful. Because, because then all you can do is build up disappointment. Now, I, I, I accept that just making Aber people scared doesn't help either, but we need to be realistic. Man muss doch die Leute irgendwie zum Handeln bringen, egal wie, würde ich jetzt sagen. Wenn die Situation so zum Schlimmsten bestellt ist und jemand, der mehr Hoffnung verbreitet als Angst derzeit oder seit zwei, drei Jahren, ist Al Gore, der ehemalige US-Vizepräsident, Friedensnobelpreisträger. Und ich konnte vor einem Jahr mit ihm, mit ihm sprechen, ähm, er ist sehr zuversichtlich, dass wir das schaffen, und zwar aufgrund von Technologien, ja. die immer günstiger ja. und besser werden. Wir schauen uns ganz kurz einen Ausschnitt an. Ein berühmter Ökonom, der verstorbene Rudi Dornbusch, sagte einmal, bis etwas passiert, geht es länger, als man denkt. Dann aber passiert es viel schneller, als man es für möglich gehalten hätte. Und diese Art von exponentieller Veränderung, wir kennen das aus dem Bereich der Technologie mit dem Moorschen Gesetz, Mobiltelefonen und vielen anderen Geräten. Es ist sehr spannend, dass dieses gleiche Muster jetzt bei erneuerbaren Energien auftaucht, bei der LED-Beleuchtung, bei Elektrofahrzeugen, Batterien, bei tausenden neuer Technologien. Die Welt befindet sich gerade im frühen Stadium einer globalen Nachhaltigkeitsrevolution ermöglicht durch digitale Werkzeuge wie die künstliche Intelligenz, das Internet der Dinge. Sie hat den Umfang der industriellen Revolution, aber mit der Geschwindigkeit der digitalen Revolution. Sie ist eine Realität in unserem Leben und wir sollten sie als Basis für echte Hoffnung wahrnehmen. Wir können das lösen. Wir werden es lösen. Die entscheidende Frage ist, wie schnell wir sie lösen werden. Und dass wir darauf vertrauen können, den Point of No Return nicht zu überschreiten. Ist das naiv? Uh, that is the voice of the English-speaking world. Uh, you know, we don't go into war saying, how can we make a profit? And that's what he's doing. How can we, how can we make a profit out of this? If I give a speech, if any of my colleagues give a speech in, in the United States, the only way that anybody will listen is if you present a business case. Here's the, here's the answer, and you can make a profit. Otherwise, nobody listens to you. And that's what he's doing. I, I mean, yes, technology can help. Yes, we can make a profit. Yes, we can, we can, you know, we can, we can build renewable energy and, and some of that. But you know, there's no profit in, in, in moving a city. There's no profit in building higher sea walls. There's no profit in dealing with the insect infestations or the poverty that's going to be spread across Africa. There's, mm. the, there's, the, there's a hundred ways that you know, this is not going to make a profit. Mm. There are 2% or perhaps that is. So let's focus on the 98% and let's, you know, it's very nice, but it's not going to work. Es ist klar, Sie plädieren dafür, dass es ein Umdenken braucht, ein anderes Mindset, nicht nur ein anderes Wirtschaftssystem, sondern auch andere Grundwerte. Ja. Und Sie sagen an einer Stelle, die Werte der Aufklärung ja. müssen neu gedacht werden, wie Werte wie Fortschritt, Freiheit, Demokratie. Können Sie das erläutern? That will take a long time. I, I, I was, uh, as I was younger, I was always fascinated by the Enlightenment. Um, Yeah, I'm Scottish, and the Scottish Enlightenment was a very powerful force. And I saw that as, as a period where I really wanted to be alive. I wanted to be part of that mm -hmm. process of thinking about well, what, is, what does property mean? What does freedom mean? What does pro progress mean? And, and now I realize that actually, uh, I don't want to describe that as a wrong turning, but, but a lot of the, the consequences that we have today, the economic system, our, our view of nature, Uh, our values in terms of property and price. And, uh, I mean, a lot of those stem from that period. Ähnlich the, wie das die Frankfurter Schule behauptet mit der Dialektik der Aufklärung. Adorn exactly. Und so. So, so it's brought us here. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not a good place. It's taking us in a bad direction now. So I think we need to re-examine re our values. What does, what does progress mean 
It's not economic growth. It's not GDP increasing. It's surely about improving human welfare. It's about living better lives. It's about making more discoveries. It's about, it's about improving life expectancy and life quality, I, I, I imagine. It's about thinking long term. It's about living in balance with nature. It's, it's, freedom is not about extreme individualism. It's not about me being selfish. It's not about competition. We need to have a cooperative society. Um, so I think we need to re, re-examine a lot of our core values. Dem- democracy too, we have this, it's a, it's a zeitgeist that everybody says we must have democracy. One of uh, Jürgen, Jürgen Randers is, 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 loves to say that at some point in the next 20 years, the people of Europe are going to ask themselves why China has grown faster for 50 years and achieved more for more people in 50 years than Europe, and yet it's not democratic. And somebody's going to ask themselves, maybe democracy is part of the problem. But they would rather live in China than in the future in a world where there is a democratic market. I come from a, from a good, democratic, based socialist family from Scotland. I believe in the voice of the people. Mm. But I also understand that if, if we're to deal with this climate problem by having everybody agree, that's going to take too long. So right now, the democratic system is, and I don't say this proudly, the democratic system is a barrier to change because we all have to agree. We have to have this, this, this consensus across society. Mm. And, and when, when people don't understand this issue, that's very difficult to achieve. So I think we need to, we need to think about how, you know, I, I'm not suggesting we have a dictatorship. We need a group of people who, who are almost like technocrats to, 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 to make the change that's necessary. That's in the interest, exactly, in, Richtung, in the yeah. interests of everybody. Now, I understand there are huge risks. Das haben viele Diktatoren schon behauptet, dass course. sie das machen, das wissen they, sie. They start with that and that. But we have to start somewhere mm. and, and, But, but that moves away from the question. The question is that we need, to, we need to rethink a lot of our basic values. Now, that will take the, the Enlightenment to you know, many decades, and it will take many decades, which is why I say there are two steps to the process. The first thing is to stop the damage, mm-hmm. and the second thing is to begin to think about how to move ahead. Mm-hmm. Wie sollten wir dann, nehmen wir das Beispiel der Freiheit, das jetzt als individuelle Freiheit verstanden wird, mit katastrophalen Folgen in der Zukunft für unsere Enkel. No, but Wie sollten wir Freiheit verstehen? Well, I mean, if you go back to Immanuel Kant or you go back to John Stuart Mill, uh, I mean, they define freedom completely differently. I mean, freedom is the is the right to say and do what you like as long as it does not hurt other people. It's a, it's about a, a freedom of thinking and expression and moving ideas forward. It's not about being as selfish as you as you, as you possibly can and not mm. caring about your consequences on society. So, Aber das Problem ist, dass diese Betroffenen ja irgendwie noch keine Stimme haben die von unseren jetzigen Handlungen betroffen sind, nämlich die sind in der Zukunft. Well, well, das ist so schwer zu verstehen halt. Deswegen. I mean, we we've got ourselves into a situation where we th- one of the one of the issues that, that that stops change is something called the historical block, which goes back to uh, Antonio Gramsci's philosophy from the 1930s. We, we, we've got this web of, of of ideas about how we run the world economic growth, small government, less regulation, individual freedom. We've got this web of ideas and a lot of it is fundamentally wrong or fundamentally the cause of the problems that we've now got. And and unraveling that web of ideas is is going to take time and working out what they should be instead is also going to take time and I, I'm not saying that's easy. Haben Sie Ideen? Wir haben noch ein bisschen Zeit. Ich würde gerne mit Ihnen darüber diskutieren, wie das aussehen würde, so eine eine Lebensform, eine Gesellschaftsform, die, die wirklich nachhaltig ist und im Einklang oder in der Balance ist mit der Natur, wie Sie sagen. Yes, I, I, I mean, I've listed out some of the basic principles in, in this book. I mean, they, they would be very strange. They appear very strange to most people. I mean, it means no uh, continuous growth in resource use. It means, it means restrictions on the population. Uh, the human population. So it means living in balance with nature. It means not measuring the economy in terms of GDP or, or, or perhaps not having a monetary system. Uh, it, it means a, such a radical change in the way we think. It's almost like, like going back to, a, to, to the sort of economies that existed in, in the Roman times or you know, centuries ago, based on completely different values. To, to, to have a system which is going to be sustainable for centuries requires 
a completely different approach. Das muss man erstmal sacken lassen. Also zurück zu den Römern, damit wir den Klimawandel irgendwie überleben. Yeah, but, but first we have to stop the climate change. That's the most important thing. We must do everything we can and, and waken the politicians up. And what we can do as individuals is, is make sure that people understand, make, help others to understand how urgent this problem is. Help others, help the politicians understand that they need to act, they need to act in the interests of humanity not the interests of the big corporations, which is what a lot of them are doing today. Das sagen Sie ja, die heutige Demokratie ist eine Scheindemokratie und äh, das ist eigentlich eine, wie sagen Sie, Plutokratie, das Geld regiert die Welt und es ist nicht mehr von den Bürgern gesteuert, sondern von, von den Unternehmen, genau. Mm. And we, we've, we've passed off our power and influence to the big firms and, and that's a big part of the problem. Ja. Ich denke mir immer, es bräuchte einfach mehr emotionale Betroffenheit, weil die halt zum Teil oder jetzt noch fehlt, weil wir die, diese Katastrophe noch nicht am eigenen Leib spüren. Und bräuchte es nicht Erzählungen, Filme auch, die uns irgendwie das spürbar machen, wie das Leben in 50 Jahren aussehen wird, damit sich die Leute das endlich mal vorstellen können? Um, I mean, one of the big problems we've got is how do we get this message across? I mean, genau. so Al Gore had his film a few years ago. He's had subsequent films. We had the limits to growth. We had Uh, silent Spring in the 1960s, we have all been trying for more than 50 years to get people to understand how, how big the problem is and how urgent the problem is. And, and we've failed. You know, the, the, the environmental movement has failed because we, we've, we've achieved nothing. We've achieved no change. Now, I've written this book. I, I think part of the reason for the failure is the timing. The timing has to be where people are open to listen. And when you see something like a, you know, 92 people being burnt in Greece, or you see something like a storm cutting through New York, or you see something like uh, the trees dying in southern Portugal, people are beginning to waken up. The timing is better, but, but people are still not listening enough. Mm. Herr Maxton, vielen herzlichen Dank für dieses Gespräch. Ich danke Ihnen. Ja, und wir sehen uns bereits am kommenden Samstagabend wieder, wenn Sie möchten, und zwar um 21.15 Uhr auf SRF 2 zur Sternstunde der Nacht. Diesmal mit Menschen, die auffallen, und zwar, weil sie ganz anders aussehen als die meisten von uns, ob gewollt oder nicht. Und jetzt gleich äh, gibt die Sternstunde Kunst einen Einblick in das künstlerische Schaffen der Schweizer Malerin Barbara Gwerder, die unter freiem Himmel wilde Berglandschaften auf die Leinwand zaubert. Und das bei jedem Wetter und jeder Jahreszeit. Ziehen Sie sich also warm an und einen schönen Sonntag. Musik